Welcome back to Worldview. Now, I first heard our next guest, Matt Dix, on the Moth Radio Hour's Best of Story Slam podcast. That was the podcast last week at themoth.org. Now, Matt had been the victim of the worst kind of cyber and real-life anonymous bullying. He was essentially blackmailed by someone who took quotes from his blog out of context and tried to get him fired from his teaching job by taking the extraordinary step of placing the hate screed in every mailbox in the small town in which he lives. Essentially, they tried to blackmail, blacklist, and destroy both him and his wife. Inside the envelope, there was a 28-page document entitled, In His Own Words. 26 of the pages were excerpts from a blog I had been writing for the last two years. My blog was provocative, but out of context, it was something much, much more. The example that my wife hates the most is this one. I wrote in a post that I opposed girls wearing sweatpants with the word juicy written on their butts. I complained that the human eye is normally drawn to text, and so I kept finding myself inadvertently looking at 10-year-old girls' butts, and I questioned parents' decision to place advertising on their daughter's ass. The only line used in the packet from that post was, I can't stop looking at 10-year-old girls' butts. They had demanded that I be terminated immediately, and she as well, as she was a teacher in the school also, and that if I was not terminated, the packet would be sent to the entire school district, every family. One month later, in the midst of my summer vacation, the packet was sent to more than 300 families in my town. It was stuffed in mailboxes, it was placed on doorsteps, it was jammed underneath windshield wipers. People were stopped in their driveway and asked to take a copy. I had to speak with him after hearing this story on the moth. Matt Dix, welcome to Worldview. Thank you very much. Matt, walk us through the story of how this cyberbully essentially tried to anonymous, anonymously take away what you most love to do, which is teach and basically turn you and your wife, or tried to turn you and your wife, into social pariahs. Sure. Um, well, I was writing a blog for several years. It actually began as a college class on blogging, and I continued writing after that. I had a lot of people reading what I was writing, and nothing that I ever wrote was related specifically to teaching or to my students or to really education in general. Someone decided that they did not like me or what I was saying for whatever reason. And so what they did is they began sort of a forensic analysis of my blog, finding individual sentences and paragraphs and taking them as out of context as possible in order to paint me in as a negative light as possible. They took all that material, they put it together in a 28 page packet that they sent to my board of education, uh, the town council, the mayor, and to uh, human resources at the school where I worked, demanding that I be fired, my wife be fired, and my principal be fired uh, since all of us were sort of knowledgeable about the fact I was writing this blog. When the town council and the board of ed and my principal decided that the charges were unwarranted and unfair, they stepped up their attack and placed that packet in the mailboxes and on the windshield wipers and on the doorsteps of over 300 families in my community in an effort to raise the pressure and raise the stakes. Now, Matt, this story has a happy ending, so let's share that part of the Moth story cast with the audience now. I was called back into the superintendent's office. At this point, they were convinced that every parent would want to remove their child from my classroom. A meeting was held, and the parents were given the option of taking their kids out of my class for the upcoming school year. There was talk about me taking a clerical position at the town hall because no right-minded parent would ever want their child in my class. I cried a lot that summer, more than I've cried before. The superintendent called, and he told me of the 23 kids that were scheduled to be in my class that year. Not one parent had asked to be removed from my classroom. In addition, another 12 had called and offered to place their children in my classroom if one of the other parents had asked to have them removed. Every single time I place a word on the page, I wonder what might happen to it and what an anonymous person might do to twist it and ruin me. I have not thought, I have not failed to think about that summer 
for one day in the last five years. It is constantly in my memory. Those people are still out there, and it's so hard knowing that they can be untouched because they're anonymous. So Matt, the entire school and community rallied around you. That, that's just so rare. What, what was it like to have that feeling of vindication? I mean, it was a wonderful feeling to know that the parents whose children had been assigned to my classroom decided to stick with me. And though it was vindication, I'll be honest, it's, you know, it's happened five years ago and it still lingers in my mind constantly. I, you know, ultimately won, I guess, because I'm still teaching and my reputation is intact. But I know that whoever did this to me, the person or a small group of people, they still exist. And I continue to write a blog. I'm a novelist now. I've published three books. Every time I write a word, I wonder when this word is going to come back at me in a new and terrifying way. Now, this week, Matt, I had to give a talk to a group of international students from 90 countries here in Wales, and, and I used your story as an example, not necessarily to scare them, but to show how there's always another response to, to, to bullies and bullying. What advice can, can you give to, to, to these young students, as well as to all of us, about the scourge of nameless, faceless people who choose this path? The approach that I take in life is one, I guess, that I, I didn't before, I never say anything anonymously. I'm often in a teacher, teacher's meeting and they'll ask us to evaluate the session at the end and there's no place for a name because they believe that the anonymous response will be the honest response. I now adopt the position that I sign everything that I write, that I stand by my words regardless of what I have to say. And it's a message I try to convey to people as much as possible, that we will reject anything that does not have a name to it. It's too easy in this world to make claims when there's no identity attached to it. And so I fight against that whenever possible and I try to live that way whenever I can. Matt, we're losing so much treasure to online bullying where, where kids decide to, to take their own lives after being bullied by other students or exploited and blackmailed by pedophiles or lured into sexual slavery. What do you tell your students and others about these types of cowards in their online life? Well, that's exactly what I tell them. I remind them that they're dealing with cowards and that a person that's unwilling to stand before you and a person that's unwilling to attach their name to something is not someone worthy of your attention or your time. What we really need to do is to have everyone buy into that belief. That bullying only works if the anonymous bully gains traction in the community, in the social network, amongst the uh, people that they're communicating with. If we tell kids and, and adults and everyone that if you're not willing to attach your name to, name to something, you're a coward who should not be listened to, if we just all accept that and agree to that, then there will be no power from these people. You know, oral storytelling is, is, is a tradition that, that we're losing so much of in the digital world. Some of it is coming back via, you know, programs like this, YouTube, etc. But there is that wonderful group of people out there called The Moth. Tell me a little bit about your experience with that and, and, and how you got involved in that. Sure. I started listening to The Moth's podcast, uh, sort of as a novelist. I love story and someone pointed it to me. And for a couple years, I listened to stories through that podcast and kept telling my wife that someday I'm going to go there and I'm going to tell a story. And that day came about two years ago. I went to New York and I put my name in the hat. And after I put it in, I prayed that it wouldn't be pulled. <laughs> but it was. And um, by some very fortunate miracle, I won that story slam. And I was instantly hooked on the idea that I can take the stage and tell a story and not have to spend a year crafting a novel before anyone hears what I have to say. Uh, so since that day two years ago, I've told about 25 or 30 moth stories. I've been fortunate to win a whole bunch of story slams and compete um, at Grand Slams. But it's the community surrounding the, the slams and the moth that I've been most astounded with. I have very good friends who I've made simply by taking the stage and sharing it with them and telling stories. It really is a community that's growing and that people consider very important in their lives. It's one of the most important things that I do now. It's one of my most treasured uh, moments is standing on a stage and telling a story now. 
Well, I mean, I've, I've been absolutely astounded by it. I just discovered it within the last few weeks. And, you know, I've been listening to several stories and, and finally got to yours just last week. And I said, God, I've really got to reach out because it was such a powerful story. Yet so many would run from a story like this. You know, you're mentioning that you were hoping your name wouldn't be pulled out of the hat. You know, I have a, a terribly vindictive ex who tries to terrorize every show in which I appear. So what advice can you give someone like myself? Well, you know, the first story that I told wasn't sort of one of those stories that I had to expose myself. And that's important, I think, to sort of dip your toe in with something that you're very comfortable with. And then eventually, as time went on, I started to realize that the best stories are the stories where you expose a vulnerability. And the kind of story that you can reach out to people like yourself and say, it's okay to stand on a stage and tell your story because it will help other people, it'll touch other people, and it might make them take the stage at some point as well. But, but I'll be honest, I was nervous telling that story. It's hard to tell that story knowing those people are still out there. They may hear this someday, and they may use this as fuel for their next fire. It's just, it's a, it's a scary thing, but I'm very glad that I did it. Well, and we are as well. Matt, thanks for taking time to, to, to be with us here this morning. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. His name is Matthew Dix. Uh, we also call him Matt. He's the author of novels, Memoirs of an Imaginary Friend, Something Missing, and Unexpectedly Milo, and the rock opera, The Clowns. Now, when he's not hunched over a computer screen, he fills his days as an elementary school teacher, and he says he's also a wedding DJ, a heathen minister, a life coach, and a lord of Sealand, something perhaps we'll have to have him back to learn more about it. But he's a former West Hartford Teacher of the Year and eight-time Moth Story Slam champion. His stories have been featured on the Moth Radio Hour and their weekly podcast. Matthew's married to his friend and fellow teacher, Alicia. They have two children who you may have heard in the background, Clara and Charlie. And another reason I like Matt is that he grew up in the small town of Blackstone, Massachusetts, so go Red Sox. Please visit his entertaining blog at matthewdix.com slash blog. But a day doesn't go by that I don't walk into my classroom, cross the threshold of that door, and think to myself, I'm still here. I'm still here doing the job that I love. Thank you.